Well, like we said this weekend, we are continuing our mini-series in Mark's gospel called Apocalypse When. We're talking all about the end of the world. And we're going to hear from Mark's gospel, we're going to hear about all kinds of crazy stuff. We're going to hear about the Great Tribulation. We're going to hear about the end of times. We're going to hear about fake messiahs and false prophets. We're even going to hear about the abomination of desolation. Sounds like, uh, sounds like something out of a Lord of the Rings movie, right? And on this wild ride through Mark chapter 13, I still think that Jesus' message is consistent throughout. What Jesus is doing for his disciples is he's warning them about what is headed their way. He's telling them what's headed their way so that they'll be able to handle it well. He's, he's telling them what's headed their way so it'll be easier for them to handle. We see this in Mark chapter 13, verses 14 through 23. Jesus says to his disciples, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing women. Mothers, pray that this will not take place in winter because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. And at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or look, there he is, do not Believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and perform miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. So be on your guard. I've told you everything ahead of time. Now, I, I bet that uh, disciple from last weekend who was like, oh, look at the pretty rocks in the temple. I bet he's really regretting that comment at this point because what, what he did was he sort of like opened up this whole can of worms for Jesus to talk all about the end of the age. But, but I love that Jesus, he takes this opportunity, this sort of offhanded comment from his disciple. And what he does is he turns it into this teaching moment. He's teaching them about what's headed their way to make it easier for them to handle. I think this is an idea that we're all probably pretty familiar with. The idea that if you can see what's coming, it's going to be easy, easier for you to adapt to it, easier for you to handle it, right? If you've ever been to uh, Silver Dollar City, then you're familiar with this idea. Because at Silver Dollar City, you got two kinds of roller coasters. Two kinds of coasters. You've got outdoor roller coasters, and then at Silver Dollar City, you also have one very special indoor roller coaster known as Fire in the Hole. Right? And on an outdoor roller coaster, what you can do is you can see what's coming. Right? You're, you're outside, it's bright, easy to see. You can see the turns and the dips and the drops and the corkscrews. And scientists have done research, roller coaster scientists have done research. Yeah, yeah, cool job, right? Have done research on how our bodies adapt to that ride as we see things coming. You can brace yourself, right? You can kind of get in the right position in your seat so that you don't have to go to the chiropractor or get a neck brace after you get off the ride. But then when you ride fire in the hole, that's an entirely different experience. It's dark. There's weird things happening all around you. There's like this drop at the end that's going to get you every time. And, I, and I, know that, I know that most of us have probably experienced fire in the hole. It just so happens to be uh, the last season that fire in the hole is in operation. So if you have not experienced this incredible attraction, you need to do that before the end of the year. But, uh, but if, if you haven't experienced fire in the hole, let's just, say, let's just say that we've never been to Silver Dollar City, never been on fire in the hole. So imagine with me, this is our first ride on fire in the hole. Imagine with me, we've never been on it before. There's going to be a whole lot of stuff coming at you that is new. There's going to be a whole lot of stuff coming at you that does not make any sense. There's a whole lot that you could not see coming. Like why in the world is there a train coming at you? Why is the bridge out? Why doesn't Red have his pants? What in the world is a bald knobber, right? Why is there, why is there water on fire in the hole? Why didn't they call it water in the hole? Too late now because they're going to get rid of the ride. There's all kinds of stuff that's coming at you that you're not going to be able to see coming. But if you've been on fire in the hole, if you know what to anticipate, if you know what to expect, well, then you can do what I do and what most people do when they ride fire in the hole. They quote every single line as the ride progresses. The dang bald knobber stole my pants, right? That's how fire in the hole is supposed to work. We're supposed to be able to know what's coming. We're supposed to be able to see what's headed our way. And when we can makes it infinitely easier, makes it infinitely easier for us to handle it. But I think that the converse of that statement is also true, that when you can't see what's coming, that when you're surprised by something, makes it infinitely harder for you to handle. 
When you can't see what's coming, it's harder to handle. Because let's say, let's say unexpectedly, you lose your job. Unexpectedly, you lose your source of income. Well, what that's going to do is that's going to challenge your idea of a God who provides. That's going to challenge your idea of a God who is caring for you. That's going to challenge your idea of self-purpose and self-worth. It's going to challenge a lot of things in, in your life, right? Let's say, let's say maybe, maybe, not, maybe not a job loss. Let's say unexpectedly, and God forbid this would happen. Let's say unexpectedly that one of your kids is in a car accident. Didn't see it coming. Completely, completely out of nowhere. Completely surprises you. Well, that's going to that's gonna really mess with your sense of a God who's looking out for you, with a God who's got you in the palm of his hand. That's really going to mess with your idea of who God is. Let's say, let's say that your spouse is unfaithful. You didn't see it coming, just completely blindsided by it, out of nowhere. Spouse is unfaithful. That's going to mess with your ideas of marriage. It's going to mess with your ideas of commitment. That's going to mess with your ideas of covenant. It's going to mess with your ideas of how, how family is even supposed to work. The reason those things are so difficult for us to handle is usually because we didn't see them coming. If you think of the most life-altering, faith-shaking moments, they're usually things that we did not see coming. So that's why Jesus is giving his disciples a heads up about what's headed their way. He wants them to be ready to handle it. He wants them to be prepared. He wants them to be ready. So what's, what's headed for the disciples? What's coming their way? No, no big deal, just the end of the world, right? Obviously, it is a pretty big deal. It's, it's a big deal to the disciples because they've got all these questions about it. But it's also, it's also pretty obviously a big deal to us because throughout the centuries of the Bible, people have misunderstood and have misinterpreted this passage right here about the end of the age. People have misunderstood and misinterpreted this passage. And because that is the case, what we're going to do together this morning is we're going to take a second look at these verses. We're going to take a second look at these verses to see what in the world they mean for us. What did they mean for the disciples? What was headed for the disciples? How were they equipped to handle it well? And the same thing is true for us. What's headed our way and how are we being equipped to handle it well? We're going to start once again in verse 14. And man, verse 14, we are, we are off to a hot start. We are off to a hot start. Jesus, he starts off with the abomination of of desolation. And with Jesus' kind of cryptic phrases in this passage, I think that his point is that you and I, we must run from the wrong things. We must run from the wrong things. Verses 14 through 19, Jesus says this, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and for nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in the winter because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning and never to be unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. In verses 14 through 19, we see that Jesus, he's telling us we've got to run from the wrong things. We've got to run from the wrong things. I love how Mark writes this passage because Mark, we've talked about how he's sort of the master of irony. He does things that we might not expect him to do in his gospel. And uh, I, love, I love the little editorial aside that he just sort of slides into this text. Mark says, hey, let the reader understand. Remember, this is Mark chapter 13. This is the passage about the end of the world. One of the most misunderstood, misinterpreted passages in the Bible. And Mark, he just, he just slides in there. Let the reader understand. Make sure you understand. The reason that, the reason that this, is, this is so difficult to understand is because Jesus is talking about some pretty complicated stuff in this passage. So, so for all of our benefit, let's just, let's just make it really simple. Let's zoom all the way out. Big picture. What is Jesus saying? Jesus says there is going to be some kind of sacrilegious person or event or moment that's going to trigger some suffering for God's people. And at that point, what God's people need to do is they need to run the other direction. They need to get away. They need to run from the wrong thing. Super simple. I think that is what Jesus is saying in this passage. Super simple. Jesus is saying run from the wrong things. But okay, so if that's the simple version... Well, then we need to dig into the weeds a little bit, right? Because what in the world is the abomination of desolation? Well, when Jesus uses that phrase, he's actually quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting from the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 11, and throughout the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11, verse 31 specifically, what Daniel does is he he prophesies some things that are going to happen to the people of God. He tells them what's coming. And one of the things that he tells God's people that's going to happen is that there's going to be a Syrian king named Antiochus Epiphanes. And Antiochus Epiphanes is going to come into the the Jewish temple. He's going to destroy Jerusalem. And then he's going to take a female pig and he's going to slaughter it upon the altar. 
That's like a big no-no in terms of Jewish kosher law, if you weren't aware. He takes this unclean animal, slaughters it in the middle of the temple. And in Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, what what Daniel says is that Antiochus Epiphanes is going to bring his armed forces. They're going to rise up to desecrate the temple fortress. They're going to abolish the daily sacrifice, and they're going to set up the abomination that causes desolation. So when Jesus uses that phrase, he's kind of referring back in the past to this event that had happened to God's people. And what Jesus is saying is that there's going to be a similar event that takes place in the future. A similar event, a similar abomination of desolation that happens in the future. So, okay, it's going to happen in the future. It's going to be bad for God's people. It's going to mess with the temple and God's place of, place of worship. But what, but what is the abomination of desolation? Who is the abomination of desolation. Bible scholars, they give us about four different options. Four different options for the abomination that causes desolation. Option number one is uh, that it might be Caligula, the Roman emperor. Roman emperor Caligula, what he did was he invaded Jerusalem and he set up these statues of himself that he intended to be worshipped as idols. So that's kind of like an abomination. You say, I'm going to take God's place. That's not good. Another option, number two, is the Zealots. The Zealots, the Zealots were a Jewish militant political party who they came into Jerusalem, or they were already in Jerusalem, they're Jews, and what they did was they came into the temple and they slaughtered all the high priests, so like Jews killing fellow Jews in the temple because they didn't like the way the Levites were running the temple. And they spilled all of these high priest's blood within the temple. That is an abomination that causes desolation. A third option is the Roman general Titus. We talked about him last week. He invades Jerusalem, surrounds the city, kills a bunch of the Jews. And then what he does is he tears the temple down stone from stone, just, just raises it, burns it to the ground. It's another version of the abomination of desolation. And the fourth option that Bible scholars give us is that the abomination of desolation might refer to the Antichrist, which is this like future figure in the end of the age who's going to set himself up against God and against his kingdom. So four different options. But the problem with each of those options is that not a single one of them are a perfect match for the prophetic words that Jesus speaks in this passage. Not a single one of them is, is like a perfect match fit. Why, why is that, right? Why can't it just be like cut and dry, black and white, easy to interpret? Well, I think that maybe, I think that maybe that's part of Jesus's point. I think that Jesus, he might, he might be doing this intentionally. He might be speaking in this way intentionally because sometimes the way prophecy works in the Bible is that there are multiple points of fulfillment. There's multiple points of fulfillment. And think about, it, think about it this way. Imagine with me that we are standing at the base of a mountain range. Okay, We're standing at the base of the mountain range. The mountains are extending out in front of us. Okay, So we can tell that yeah, there might be like some mountains. This is image number one. So we can tell there might be like some mountains in between there, like multiple different peaks, but we, re- we can't really tell like how far apart they are or where they fall. And if we're, if we're being really honest, looking at that mountain range front on, it looks kind of like just one big mass of mountain. But now let's say, let's say we, we cut to the side. Okay, we pan to a side view. Image number two. We pan to a side view of this mountain range. Well, now we can tell that there's all kinds of different peaks and they're spread out, right? And they're, and they're, and they're, and they're split up. They're not all right next to each other. They're not all right on top of each other. And I think that's kind of how prophecy works from time to time in the Bible. That maybe you and I, we're not in a very good position to have the perspective to tell where all these different points are of fulfillment are at. So, so bringing it back to the text, I think that might be part of Jesus's point. I think that Jesus is saying that time and time again, throughout history, past, present, and future, what's going to happen is people are going to set themselves up against God and his kingdom. And our response as people who've put our faith in Jesus, our response is always to run from the wrong things. Anyone and everyone who sets themselves up against God and his kingdom, we run the other direction. We run from the wrong things. And the way Jesus describes running from the wrong things, it's very interesting. He uses all kinds of imagery to convey haste, to convey the kind of hurry up that he is talking about. The first thing he mentions are Jewish rooftops, which is really strange for us because we don't spend very much time on our rooftop. But in ancient Palestine, rooftops were flat, kind of like this picture. And you would usually have an exterior staircase. And let's say you were hanging out on the, on the rooftop, and, like, I don't know, watering your garden or something. And uh, the abomination of desolation shows up. You know, it's time to run. What's going to happen is you're going to walk down that exterior staircase and you're going to pass by the entrance to your house. And Jesus says, you're going to want to go into your house. And you're going to want to pack your bags. And you're going to want to get all your things and you're going to want to be distracted. But Jesus says, when you're running from the wrong things, 
You can't afford to be distracted. You can't even stop back inside your house to grab the stuff you need. He says, if you're in the field, don't even come back home to get your cloak. You ever left home on like a cold day when you needed your coat, but you're in a hurry and you forgot it? That's the kind of hurry up that Jesus is trying to get his disciples to have when it comes to running from the wrong things. And Jesus and I, we've obviously got the same idea about things that are slow. Because when I think of things that are slow, I think of pregnant women and breastfeeding women. Those are things that just can't move fast. Nothing against them. They just are not going to move fast. That's how, that's how it's going to work. Jesus says, hey, it's going to be rough in those days for ladies who are having babies or who are trying to feed their babies. That's going to be hard. That's going to be rough. And then the last, the last thing Jesus says is pray that it doesn't happen in the wintertime. Kind of a weird statement. Why, why, would, why would it matter what time of year the abomination of desolation shows up? Well, in the Jewish rainy season or in the Palestinian rainy season, it was cold and it was wet. And what would happen is the deep ravines in the gorges of the desert, they would flood. And I think, yeah, we got a picture here. So imagine like that deep ravine or that deep gorge flooded and you're trying to cross it. It's impossible, right? Imagine, imagine trying, trying to hold on to your bed. Jehoshaphat, you better latch on. We're crossing this thing, baby. How's that going to work? It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. Jesus is saying nothing can hold you back, not the difficulty, not how hard it's going to be, not any of the distractions. When it comes to running from the wrong things, we've got to get out and we've got to get out fast. That's the imagery that Jesus uses to convey what it looks like to run from the wrong things. Now, I've not, I've not been in a lot of situations where I felt like, man, I need to get out. Like, this is not safe. I need to run from the wrong things. I've not been in a lot of situations like that, but I can, think of, I can think of one time in my life where I was in a situation that I probably shouldn't have been in, uh, in a situation where I probably should have left. It was actually at a, at a high school party. Um, you guys, I don't get the wrong idea. I did not go to a lot of parties in high school, mainly because I didn't get invited to a lot of parties in high school. <laughs> but uh, I was invited to one party. It was a graduation party for my friend Morgan Storer. And me and all my buddies, we got invited to Morgan Storer's graduation graduation party. A little bit of backstory for you. So right before the graduation party, there was a semi truck that had crashed on the highway right by Morgan's house. Just so happened to be a semi truck that was carrying like brick upon brick of professional fireworks. So you can see where this is headed. Uh, so, so there's all kinds of fireworks in the mix already. And then Morgan's dad, a little more backstory. Morgan's dad, he was the cool dad right? And he was cool with like serving alcohol to underage minors uh, as long as they didn't drive off of his property. Like that's no problem then. And then uh, Morgan's dad, he was cool with like providing copious amounts of said alcohol to those same underage minors. And then, uh, and then Morgan's dad, he was, also, he was also the kind of dad who had like no problem with teenagers who would bring some narcotics onto his property to employ for like party purposes. Now I grew up in Michigan. Michigan has since legalized marijuana, but man, back in the day, he would have been in so much trouble, right? Like today he'd be, he'd be off the hook probably. But so, so you can see how this is shaping up to be a, a pretty disastrous party. Okay, and uh, the, moment, the moment that I knew that I needed to leave, the moment that I should have run from the wrong things, it, uh, it came when, when Morgan's dad, who had been enjoying himself a little bit too liberally as well, uh, he came outside toting like two bricks of fireworks and he tossed them into the bonfire. And at this point, I, like, don't get the wrong idea. I'm not like a cool kid. I'm like, I'm standing like in the back, like arms crossed, thinking about how my mom's gonna, I think my mom's heard this story. If she hasn't, Mom, I didn't do anything I wasn't supposed to, watching online. So I'm standing in the back. I'm thinking about how my mom's going to kill me. And there's fireworks going off. There's teenagers who are inebriated, ducking for cover. There's smoke everywhere. And all I can think is, man, I really need to leave, but I can't. Because this is like terrifying and it's amazing and it's, it's like a car wreck and I can't tear my eyes away from it. And in that moment, I knew that I needed to leave, but, but I didn't kind of wanted to see how things were going to play out. I didn't leave and I knew that I should have. Maybe, maybe a better example, maybe a different example. So when I, when I graduated from high school, right after Morgan Storer's graduation party, I, uh, I went to college, okay? And I was like, I'm in college. I'm a big boy now, right? I'm an adult. And I decided one of my first adult things that I was going to do, one of the first like, like big boy things I was going to do is I was going to watch my first ever TVMA show. Oh yeah, <laughs> big boy stuff, right? A show that's rated TVMA because I am mature. That's how mature people say mature. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna watch this show. I pulled up Game of Thrones because I was like, I was a nerd and I was into nerdy stuff. And I was like, this is like Lord of the Rings, so I'm gonna watch it. And I made it like five minutes into the first episode. Had to shut my laptop. And I was like, man, as a single college dude, this show is far, far too inappropriate for me to be watching. There's no way. I, I'm not going to be able to do this. It's not going to work. I ran from the wrong things. 
I think that's what it looks like to run from the wrong things, to say nothing's going to distract me, to say nothing's going to get in my way. I'm not going to let anything stop me. I'm going to get away as fast as possible, as far as possible. And I don't think that, I don't think that running from the wrong things just applies to the end of the age. I think that actually Jesus's words apply to all of life. I think that it is always the right decision to run from the wrong things and instead run toward Jesus, to get as far away as fast as possible from anything and anyone that would set themselves up against God's kingdom and God himself. And instead to get as close as possible, as quickly as possible to Jesus and to getting to know him better. But the difference is, very similar experience for us and Jesus' disciples, the difference though is that we're not going to deal with Caligula putting up a statue of himself and telling us to worship it. We're not going to deal with Titus tearing the temple stone from stone. Nobody's going to come and tear the church down. So what, what does the abomination of desolation look like for us? Well, I think it looks like anything and anyone in our modern day, in our modern age, that would set itself up against God and his kingdom. Immediately, I think of things like culture, because the current cultural worldview is one in which there's no objective idea of what's right and what's wrong. Culture tells us, hey, we get to decide what's right and what's wrong, putting ourselves in the place of God. That's setting ourselves up against God and his kingdom. I think also, I think also of distractions, right? Kind of like the distractions that, that Jesus mentions, the distractions like your cloak and your belongings and the things that you might think that you need. And Jesus, he says that even that stuff, it can't get in your way. Nothing can get in your way when it comes to running from the wrong things. I think also of the gods of self. What, what does that mean? Well, it's all of those self words, self-care, self-fulfillment, self-actualization, self-confidence, any of those self words, which there's nothing wrong with them in and of themselves. But the problem is when those things become the main thing, when those things become the rule, when those things become the determining factor in our lives, that's the problem. That's when self has become a god. So those are the kinds of things that you and I might have to run from. And if we want to, let's say we want to make it like super spiritual real quick, super, super spiritual. So the abomination of desolation, it takes place in the temple, right? And the New Testament tells us that we are now the temple. We are the place that houses the presence of God. God's presence dwells within us. So that might mean that there's some things in, in us, in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts, in our bodies that we do that are just like the abomination of desolation that set themselves up against God and his kingdom. I'm thinking of things like sexual sin and lust and pornography, all kinds of sinful things we do within our hearts and our minds and our bodies that set themselves up against God and his kingdom. And those are the kinds of things that Jesus warns his disciples that they're gonna need to run from, the wrong things that they've got to be running from. And because the disciples, they know what's headed their way, they're able to handle it. They're able to handle it well because Jesus has given them a heads up about what's headed their way. What else was headed for the disciples? Not just the difficulty that we see in verses 14 through 19. No, there was also going to be some distractions headed their way. Jesus says that they're going to have to deal with some fake messiahs and some false prophets. Verses 20 through 22, Jesus continues and he says, if the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he's chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. So what Jesus says in these verses is we've got to be able to recognize the real Messiah. We must recognize the real Messiah. Messiah. We've got to recognize the real Messiah. And if you think about the warnings that Jesus has already given his disciples in these verses, they're incredibly grim. They're incredibly dark. He said that there's going to be days of distress, the abomination of desolation. There are going to be days that are unequaled by any other. Now, if we, if we want to be like historical, the Jewish historian Josephus, he, he wrote about that, that war that Titus brought into Jerusalem where he conquered the city and destroyed the temple. One of those options we mentioned for the abomination of desolation. In Josephus, he writes that when Titus invaded Jerusalem, he surrounded the city and he would crucify 500 Jews each day. There's so many Jews crucified each day, they ran out of wood for crosses. That's pretty grim. That's pretty dark. Gets even worse. Josephus tells us that things were so bad under the Roman siege, there was so little food, so little food that a mother ended up cooking her own infant so that she would have food to eat. And some of the defenders, the Jewish defenders, smelled that there was food and asked if they could have some. It's how grim and how dark things have gotten during these days, the days of distress. But then in the midst of that comes verses 20 through 22. We get this glimmer of hope in the midst of that darkness. Because Jesus said in that time, what God's going to do, 
is he's going to cut those days short because he's looking out for the elect. He's looking out for the people who have put their faith in him. That's all the elect means. In the Old Testament, the elect, those were God's people, right? The Israelites, the people that God had chosen. But now in the New Testament, and the New Testament's a little bit broader. Same idea, God's family, but God's family's extended to anyone who's put their faith in Jesus. And this is where those fake messiahs and false prophets come in. Because God's looking out for his elect. He's looking out for the people who've put their faith in him and the people who stay faithful to him. But Jesus is warning his disciples about what's headed their way. There's gonna be distractions. There's gonna be all kinds of opportunities for them to be unfaithful. All kinds of fake messiahs and false prophets who are going to try to lead them astray. And what are those, what are those fake messiahs and false prophets like? Well, Jesus, Jesus, he's, he's the guy who says, hey, don't, don't tell anybody that I'm the Messiah. It's not the right time yet. Jesus is the guy who performs a miracle and says, don't, don't tell anybody I'm the one who did this. They won't understand yet. Jesus is the guy who doesn't reveal himself into the cross, but these fake messiahs and these false prophets, they'll do all kinds of pretend signs and pretend wonders in order just to gain a following. So Jesus, he warns his disciples that this is what's headed their way so they can be ready to handle it, so they can be ready to recognize the real Messiah. What what does it look like to recognize something that's fake? Well, I think the best way to recognize something that's fake is to be really well acquainted with the real deal. I learned two things this week from two of my friends in teaching team. So I just found out this week, number one, that the secret service is in charge of policing counterfeit money. Had no idea. It's a fascinating topic. You should look it up on the Google. So the secret service is in charge of policing counterfeit money. Remember, that means they take counterfeit bills off the market. How are they trained to recognize that fake money? How are they trained to recognize those counterfeit bills? Well, they're not trained to recognize them at all. Instead, They're trained to know exactly what a real dollar bill looks like. They know all the signs. They know all the seals. They know all the watermarks. They know all the fancy artwork that if you fold your dollar bill a certain way, that it'll like predict 9-11 happening 40 years ago. It's it's a conspiracy on YouTube. You should check out sometime. So the Secret Service, that's how they figure it out. They're not trained to recognize the fakes. They're trained to recognize the real deal. They're very familiar with what is real. And if we're going to recognize the real Messiah, if we're going to recognize what's fake, then we've got to do the same. We've got to be acquainted, very well acquainted with the real Messiah, with Jesus himself. So if we're going to, if we're going to be honest though, let's say, let's say somebody comes up to us and they're like, hey, I'm Jesus. I'm going to save the day. No, that's not, that's not a threat. We're going to be like, no, you're crazy. We don't, you, you, you run a cult. We're not like, we're not going to listen to you. But the real threat for us, it's not people who pretend to be the Messiah. No, it's things that promise to do what only Jesus can do things that promise to take Jesus' place, things that promise the kind of salvation that only Jesus can actually bring in our lives. I think following a fake Messiah, it looks, it looks kind of like this. If there's, if there's something in your life where, where you could say, man, if I, just had, if I just had blank, then I'd be content. Then I'd be fulfilled. Then I'd have joy. Then I'd have peace. Then I'd feel loved. Then I'd be a good dad. Then I'd be a good mom. Then I'd be a good spouse. If I just had blank, Whatever you fill in the blank with, that you're looking for all those things, all those things that Jesus offers, like fulfillment and love and peace and joy, that's the fake Messiah in your life. Whatever you're trusting to give you the things that only Jesus can give to you, that is the fake Messiah. That is the false prophet that's leading you away from Jesus. What else, what else does it look like to follow a fake Messiah? Another example maybe is, is the, that book, uh, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie, you ever read that book? It's a kid's book. It's pretty good. But if you give a mouse a cookie, what, what happens is there's always something next, right? There's always something missing. There's always something that the mouse still wants. Following a fake Messiah works the same way. You're always going to be left wanting more. You're always going to be you're always going to be wanting something that only Jesus can provide. That's what it looks like to follow a fake Messiah. I mean, if Jesus if Jesus walked in to New Life Church, I know this is cheesy. Would we would we recognize him? Like, what if we what if we put a lineup of Jesuses on the string? Could you pick out Could you pick out the real Jesus? We've got so we got the white Jesus. Okay, it's a good painting, right? And then we've got in the middle we've got like Jewish Jesus. So this is archaeologists and biologists and Bible scholars' best attempt at recreating or rendering what Jesus might have actually looked like. I'll be honest, that's not my favorite Jesus. Uh, but then but then the third one, the third one that's Jonathan Rumi. If you don't know, if you haven't watched, he is the star of the hit Jesus TV show called The Chosen. And when my wife and I, we first watched The Chosen, she said, man, I don't know who that actor is, 
but that's my Jesus. And I said, no, 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 Chelsea, that is not your Jesus. That is a fake Messiah, a false prophet. I didn't actually say it. I mean, he's not, not even that good looking. He just looks like a normal dude. If I had long hair and a scraggly beard, I'd look just this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. On a, ser- on a more serious note, though, would we really be able to recognize who Jesus is? Would we really be able to tell the, the fakes from the real deal, the frauds from the real Messiah? I think the only way we can do so is when we're really well acquainted with the real Jesus, with the real Jesus. And because Jesus has warned his disciples and thereby Jesus has warned us that we're gonna face distractions. The distractions are headed our way. There's gonna be fake messiahs and false prophets that promise to do what only Jesus can do. Things in our lives that say they're gonna give us what only Jesus can give. Because we know that's coming, because we know what's headed our way, you and I are well equipped to handle it. Now in the final verse, in verse 23, Verse 23, we kind of get to like a purpose statement for this whole passage. Jesus says, hey, this is the whole reason. This is it. This is the whole reason I've told you all of these things ahead of time. Verse 23, it tells us to be on guard. We must be on guard. Verse 23, so be on your guard. I've told you everything ahead of time. So be on your guard because I've told you everything ahead of time. If you think about who Jesus is talking to, He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to the people who were the closest to him. So maybe for us, that means that if we think we're close to Jesus, then the the next right step for us might be to be on guard. Maybe being on guard is the next right thing for us to do. And if you're reading closely in Mark chapter 13, you'll notice that Jesus, he said this same phrase three different times. Mark chapter 13, verse five, Jesus says, don't be deceived. Mark chapter 13, verse nine, Jesus says, be on your guard. Mark chapter 13, verse 23, Jesus says, be on your guard. That's why I've told you all of these things ahead of time. It's so that for the purpose that you might be on your guard and that you might stay on guard. So what does it, what does it look like to be on guard? Well, well, the, the, the original Greek of the New Testament can be translated a couple of different ways there. It can, it can be translated as paying attention. So being on guard could look like paying attention. Or being on guard, it could also be translated as keeping watch. Paying attention, keeping watch. That means that, that being on guard has nothing to do with calculating the end of the age based on the blood moons and the Mayan calendar, right? That is nothing to do with being on guard. No, being on guard means that you stay faithful, right here and right now, even in the midst of difficulty. Being on guard means that you stay focused right here and right now, no matter what distractions might come your way. That's what it looks like to be on guard. When I think about how Jesus sets this passage up, he's letting his disciples know about what's headed their way. I've told you everything ahead of time, right? And as Christians, a lot of the times what we do is we're like, Man, I just don't know what to do, Jesus. God, what's your will? What's your plan for my life? Well, Jesus has made it incredibly clear what he wants us to do. He tells us right here in verse 23, be on guard. Verse 23, it tells us the next right step for all of us, no matter where we stand with Jesus, it's to be on guard, to stay faithful and to stay focused no matter what. And the way Jesus sets this up is he tells them all this stuff so that they can be on guard. He makes them aware of what's headed their way so that they can be ready to handle it. And when I think about that idea of people like getting ready, knowing what's coming, preparing or being ready to handle things. I think of people who like still have to still have to study for tests. I'm the youth pastor, so I work with students and like they still take exams and they still take tests and they still take quizzes and I laugh at them every time and I thank Jesus every time because I don't have to do any of those things anymore. My wife, she just got ready to start her master's degree. God bless her. It's going to be awful. She's going to have to take tests and quizzes and write papers again, and I'm going to laugh the whole time. But that's what, that's what you do, right, for a test or for a quiz. You try to, you try to make yourself aware of what's coming at you ahead of time. You, you write, write stuff out on the study guide, right? Like, you want to know what's headed your way so that you can be ready to handle it well. I also think of, let's think of people who play, like, sports competitively still as an adult. I don't know, I don't know if, if you're an adult in the room who plays sports competitively, then you are, you are a far, far more interesting person than me because I go to bed at 8 p.m., and, man, I love it. Like, that is just not the life that I live anymore. But if you, if you play a sport then you probably spend a pretty decent amount of time practicing for that sport. You spend a decent amount of time preparing yourself for whatever is coming your way. That's what it looks like to be ready, to be on guard, to be prepared for anything that might come your way. And I think that 
I think that Jesus is, he's, he's being very specific to our spiritual lives, right? He's saying, hey, you know, you might not know some of the stuff that's going to happen in the rest of your life, but here's what you do know. You do know that if you're going to follow me, then you're going to face some difficulty. Great tribulation, abomination of desolation, times of distress like no other. Some difficulty. You know that's coming, but because you know what's headed your way, you can handle it. And then Jesus, he also says, hey, if you're going to follow me, you know you're going to face some distractions. You know you're going to face some distractions. There's going to be fake messiahs and false prophets that come your way. But Jesus says, hey, I've let you know ahead of time. You're going to be able to handle it just as long as you stay on guard. Now, if we, if we go all the way zoomed out, big picture, and we look at this text, if we're honest with ourselves, I think there's a little bit of tension in the text. A little bit of tension in the text between what we know, because Jesus, he's making us aware of things that are coming our way. We know a lot, right? We know we're going to face distraction. We know we're going to face difficulty, but there's also some tension between what we know and what we don't know, because we don't know the dates and the times and the details and the whens and the wheres and the whys. There's a lot that we don't know, maybe even more that we don't know than we do know. So what do we do with that tension between the two? James R. Edwards, Bible scholar, he's got a fantastic quote that explains this well. He says that we thus do not have a foolproof sign in the abomination that causes desolation. Like the disciples, the church throughout the ages has sought for infallible proofs of the end. That's perhaps inevitable for certain knowledge relieves us of the responsibilities of watching and of waiting. But the abomination that causes desolation is no such sign. No, it requires scrutiny and it requires watchfulness. It requires us to evaluate to be on guard, just like Jesus said a few moments ago. The salvation that's brought by Jesus, it's not a salvation of knowledge. No, it's a salvation. It's a salvation that's a way of following, of faithfulness, of standing guard at our posts. We don't try to get rid of the mystery in following Jesus. No, we get comfortable living in that mystery. We get comfortable with that tension, the tension between what we know and what we don't. James R. Edwards, he says it's 100% true. You're gonna know some of what's headed your way. 100% true. There's some stuff that you're not going to know. So what do we do with the tension? We run from what's wrong. We run from the wrong things. What do we do with that tension? What do we do with that tension? We recognize the real Messiah. What do we do with that tension? We stay on guard. And I believe that is what it looks like to know what's headed our way and to handle it well. Jesus, this morning we look to you because your word has made known to us what is headed our way. And Jesus, we know that we need your help to handle those things well. Whether we're facing difficulty, whether we're facing distraction, Jesus, help us to stay on guard. Help us to run from the wrong things, the things that would set themselves up against you and your kingdom. Help us instead, Jesus, to recognize the real Messiah, not to get duped by the fakes and the frauds, the things that pretend to promise only what you can do. Jesus, help us to recognize the real you. Help us to be ready for what's headed our way because you've already given us a heads up that it's coming. Help us to handle it well, Jesus. We're asking all these things in your name. Amen. Thanks so much for checking us out online. I just hope that whatever you saw, that it was a blessing and an encouragement to your life. And if you'd like to give today, there are two ways you can do so. You can text your amount to 84321, or you can go to giving.nlspringfield.com and give that way. And if you'd like to join us in person, we'd love to have you. Our service times are at 8, 9.30, and 11. And if you're new, in the first Sunday of every single month, we have an event called Party with the Pastors, which is a great way for you to get to know us, and it's a great way for us to get to know you. So we look forward to seeing you there. 